Good evening and welcome to FaithBridge tonight. My name is Tanya Van Dongen and I am the prayer coordinator here at FaithBridge. Uh, I'm so glad to see all of you here. We had great emails this week of people who really appreciated and enjoyed last week. Uh, and then we also had some emails from people that seemed a little puzzled, a little confused, and I bumped into some of my good friends and uh, they, they all expressed a little confusion about the Kairos Freedom Ministry. So I thought before we start tonight, I'm just gonna take a minute and explain um, really basically the three-step process of the Kairos Freedom Ministry which we've birthed here at FaithBridge. You all have to be patient because you know when you do something the first time, there's bound to be glitches you have to work out. So the Freedom Basic classes which you're attending tonight is a four session uh, step and it is preparation like I explained last week. If you can imagine uh, you decide that you were going to run a 5K race, you would not walk out the door and hit the road running. You would start stretching and maybe for a few days you would do some little walks around the block and then go for a little run and then you would try and run your race. This is very similar. Kairos, the event Kairos is a lot to take in in two days. And these four classes really prepare us and get our, get us, gets us ready for that. Uh, we decided that we were going to have the first round of Freedom Basics classes now. In six weeks, we're going to repeat it here at uh, FaithBridge Klein Campus. Then in July, we're going to have it in the Woodlands for Faith Bridgers that would find that more convenient. And then six weeks before our conference, we're going to have it again here. That would allow anybody who had conflicts now or people who want to invite somebody to give others opportunity to attend it and it would prepare a lot of people for the conference. So step two is the Kairos event. That is a two day event. It's really on a Friday evening and on a Saturday. And um, the dates that they have penciled in for this would be September the 29th and the 30th. If they change it, it will be just to be for the weekend before then. But for now, that's the dates that we've set aside for that. And then post Kairos weekend, we will have a team of prayer counselors. These are lay prayer counselors who have been trained to meet with you and um, through the guidance of the Holy Spirit, lead you in one-on-one -on -one prayer. Uh, and you will be able to call, schedule a time and meet with two people and spend some time with them in some uh, very specific healing prayer. Okay, so that's my little explanation. Does anybody have any questions? Good. So let's pray before we start tonight's lesson. Father God, we thank you that we can be here tonight to learn more about ourselves and who you made us to be. Lord, I just pray that you will use this opportunity to teach us. I ask that things that have been on our mind and distractions that, that we have will not bother us tonight, that you will surround us with your protection, uh, keep us focused and open our hearts to hear the message that you have for each one of us. Lord, I pray for me. I just ask that you will be with me, help me to remember what I want to say and uh, just use me tonight as your instrument. We thank you, Lord, that we are able to meet here at FaithBridge and we just pray that you will bless this time we have together. In Jesus' name. Amen. So they were these neighbors. The one mom was your typical suburban, modern 21st century mother. They were into all the gadgets, everything that made life easy and convenient, fast foods when they needed, they led a busy life and often just grabbed something on the go. The other family, the other mom, was your back to nature kind of gal. 
Everything was organic. She grew her own vegetables, no modern medicines, essential oils. And she even went as far as deciding that she was going to make her own laundry detergent and string a clothesline so that their clothing could dry in the fresh air and in the sunlight. We will call the modern lady Wendy and the other lady Annette. So Wendy and her family had a tradition. On a Saturday morning, they slept in, and then they gathered around the breakfast table to catch up with each other. Um, she cooked breakfast, and everybody just had a time together there. Annette chose to do her laundry on Saturday mornings. So one Saturday morning, Wendy walked into the kitchen and they were sitting around the table. She looked out the window and lo and behold, there is a clothesline in plain sight full of laundry. And she looks at this indignantly and she says, look at that. She's gone to all this trouble and her laundry isn't even clean. She should just get tired like the rest of us and save herself some trouble. Well, the next Saturday rolls around. Same thing, Wendy and her family gather around the table and Wendy looks up and there, we have some more laundry and she says, this is ridiculous. Her clothes are dirty. If she just got a washing machine like the rest of us, she would save herself some time and her clothes would be clean. Well, the third Saturday rolls around and they sit down at the table. Wendy looks up and, <gasps> Oh my goodness, the laundry is still out there, but it is spotless. She says to her husband, I knew it. She went and got herself some decent laundry detergent and he bought her a washing machine. He looks at her, he says, no, honey, I washed the windows. <laughs> Often our greatest challenge in life is our perspective, literally, the window that we look through. And freedom is such a cliched word that even our understanding of what freedom is could influence how you experience this freedom process through Kairos. So what do you think freedom really is? And who do you think should attend Kairos? This is our definition. The purpose of Kairos Freedom Ministry is to help you become the person that you were created and redeemed by God to be. There are many different reasons why you are here tonight. Some of you may have seen Pastor Ken's video and you were touched by it. Some of you were sitting there and your spouse was touched by it and so they went, honey, we're going to that. Maybe there's been something in your life that you have struggled with for years. Maybe something that you have never even told somebody, but you are finally ready and you have the courage to tackle that monster. But I think I have the best reason why you should be here. It is because you are human and life happens to everyone. It is impossible to get through life without being hurt sometimes or without losing an emotional arm or a leg here and there. And we don't know how to recover from that so we limp along until we are in so much pain or something breaks and it forces us to go and find some help. So Kairos is not just for those who think they're struggling with some deep and dark sin. It's for all of us. Because when it comes to sin and pain, the playing field is level. So whatever your reason is for being here tonight, I want to tell you we are glad that you took that step and that you were brave enough to say, I am going to go on this journey you may discover some things that you didn't even realize you had. Or there may be some things in your life that you thought you put to bed years ago. And as we start digging, you're going to find that those things 
are still affecting you today. So let me ask you this. Who in here has ever tried to change anything about themselves? And how successful were you? Let's go even further. Has the church done a great job in helping us change so that as believers, when we're running around, people can look at us and just see there's something different about us? No. We are not very good at changing. And statistics tell us that when we look at believers and we look at non-believers, we pretty much struggle with the same stuff. We pretty much behave the same way. So we're clearly missing something. This class is going to look at the things we try and do to change ourselves. There is a professor of anthropology at UCLA who studied human behavior specifically related to how we change. And he developed this grid, which he called the levels of change. And there are five levels. Tonight, the topics will be the first four of these levels. And really, I think we can more accurately refer to them as the things we do to try and change that don't work. If you look to your uh, handout, you'll see there's a little pyramid. And instead of working from the top down, we are going to be looking at our levels of change working from the bottom up. Each one of these levels has more power and has more influence in our life than the level before it. So the first one is our environment. And it looks something like this. If only my husband appreciated me more, if only my kids would listen to me, or if only I had a different job, then something would be better. We think that if we change our environment, we will be different. My husband and I moved from South Africa 19 years ago this month, and we love living in Texas. In fact, uh, Peter bought himself a T-shirt recently that says, if you are lucky enough to live in Texas, you are lucky enough. <laughs> the reason we moved is because we wanted to have a better, a better future for our four girls. We wanted them to have better education and healthcare and a safer living environment. And I can tell you, we have had the blessing of that every day since we've lived here. But after we arrived and we settled into our new normal life, guess what we found? All the stuff, the personal stuff that we had been struggling with had moved with us. We still had four kids, life was still hectic, we were still broke, and all of the other stuff. When we are dealing with heart issues, changing our environment doesn't help change our heart. There's an old saying that goes, wherever you go, there you are. And that is really true. The apostle Paul figured this out. And he gave us a little word of advice in Philippians. He says, I have learned to be content no matter my circumstances. That is a lot easier said than done. Have you ever wondered what got him to the place where he was able to say, doesn't matter what happens to me, I am content. So we see that changing our environment is not effective to change our hearts. The second level is changing our behavior. Sooner or later, we figure out that the problem is not our husband or our children or our house. And so we start thinking, the problem is with me. I am the problem because I am the one following myself around everywhere. And it goes like this. If I could only stop doing this one thing, or if I could only learn to do that, then life will be better. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Now, 
I agree, there are lots of little things about our behavior that are easy to change, and we certainly should be working on those. For example, I can almost say that I have trained myself to hang up my car keys when I walk in the back door. Of course, I've only been working on this for 35 years. <laughs> Maybe by a few more, I'll have it down. But some things like anger, and depression, and frustration, and addictions, and uh, unforgiveness, and anxiety, and all of these things that we deal with, these things are a lot harder to change. So psychology has told us that we have to think ourselves into behaving differently. If we just exercise enough willpower or if we could only be more self-disciplined, we will be able to change ourselves. Has anybody here ever gone on a diet? Okay, don't let me raise my hand by myself. The moment I decide I'm going on a diet, all I can think about is everything I can't eat. Now, they say confession is true for the soul, and so tonight I am going to make a true confession. This is real. I have never actually thought like this, and I have never actually said this to anybody, so I'm gonna say it. I am a serial dieter. <laughs> I have spent my entire adult life trying to be skinny. I can tell you, I have tried every diet in the book, not just the magazine version. I bought the book, and I read the book, and I could tell you why this diet is different and why it is going to work for me. And so while I was preparing for this talk, I did some math, and I thought, well, for the last 25 years, I have lost approximately 20 pounds at least once a year. Which means, by now, I have lost 500 pounds, <laughs> and I am still not skinny. <laughs> it seems the harder we try something, the more we are tempted to do it, the more we think about it. And what makes the problem worse is this, what we do is connected to what we think, is connected to what we feel. And so I decide I am going to change, I am going to do something new, and I go for it. But something happens, and I fail. So what do I think? Man, I failed again. And what does that make me feel? I feel like, man, I'm such a loser. I know I am never gonna get over this. And it goes round and around and around. Do you know, I googled self-help books just for the purpose of tonight. And I found a list that says the top 50 self-help books that you should read. That's ridiculous. <laughs> And what does that tell us? It doesn't work. <laughs> Basically, it tells us that looking at me, little old messed up me, to fix little old messed up me, is just not gonna help us. So the next thing we try and do to change is go to church. When people decide to make a fresh start, you will often hear them say, well, I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna do that and I am going to start going to church again. And basically church is quite good at telling us what we should and shouldn't do. Um, we hear pretty much two things, the things we should do and the things we shouldn't do. So let's look at the first kind, the prohibitive kind, the things the church says we shouldn't do. They are all kinds of church rules like we're not supposed to judge each other. But, ladies, when somebody walks in on a Sunday morning and she is wearing something that's really quite provocative, I know what you're thinking. <laughs> you're thinking, 
She shouldn't be wearing that. And guys, you are supposed to pretend you didn't even see her. <laughs> now, you, gentlemen, you are not going to walk in here on a Sunday morning and see your buddy across the atrium and say, hey, man, did you see that blankety, blankety, blank play in the game last night? Because we don't cuss in church. We only cuss in the car on our way to church. <laughs> I'm just joking, but we have to laugh at ourselves a little bit. Otherwise, this stuff gets quite serious. All right, so the second thing is the prescriptive method of changing. These are the things that we should do. Now, I need you to help me. I am going to say some things and then ask you to fill in the blanks. Welcome to church. It's time to change. Now that you have found Jesus, you should probably all read your Bibles. And you should have a regular, quiet time. And you should probably write all of this down in your new journal. See, you guys are good. I bet you do all this stuff. Please don't get me wrong. All of these things are actually essential to the growth of our walk. All of these things are necessary. And as we've seen with the resolve focus, we must make time to spend with God. We must spend time in the word because the Lord uses those things to work in our hearts and to bring about change. But just following the rule for the sake of following the rule also doesn't work. Jesus says that he came so that we may have life and have it to the full. But many times believers think this, here we are gathered together to talk about how we are sinners saved by grace. We are doing the best we can, arm wrestling ourselves into behaving well on the good days, and thank goodness there's grace for the bad days. And that is pretty much all we have, so let's hope we can hang on and pray until Jesus comes. That is not life to the full. Most of us have issues that prevent us from living this life to the full that Jesus said he came to give us. So what does God say about changing our behavior? In Matthew 6.33, we see that he tells us to first seek his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to us as well. God made us. And basically, he knows that the things we focus on, the things we pay attention to, are the things that organize our whole life. So whether you want to give up an addiction, or fix your marriage, or control your anger, or deal with your depression, whatever behavior you have fixed on to try and change will be the thing that begins to rule your life. But, he says, if we focus on him, if we focus on the right things, then all these other things will begin to change in our lives. So this brings me to a very important point. In the life of a believer, freedom is not the absence of something, but it is the presence of someone. Freedom is not the absence of my worst sin, but it is the presence of God in my life. The third level of change is our capabilities. Now remember, we're moving up. We started with our environment, and then we looked at our behavior, and now we're looking at our capabilities. So what are these? Capabilities are a little bit harder to see because it's a little bit deeper inside. Our capabilities are the default setting that we base whatever we believe to be true about ourselves. It sets what I can and cannot do, and I've convinced myself of things that will never be different. And the reality about our default setting is that we will not rise above it. Until 1954, nobody had ever run the mile in under four minutes. And then 
In that year, a guy by the name of Roger Bannister broke the four-minute mile. And six weeks later, somebody else did it. And in the nine years that followed, another 200 athletes achieved that impossible goal. Why? Because they had changed their default settings. Our default setting makes us think, I could never do that. But what if you could? What if your default setting was based on the truth of who God says you are? What if it was based on the truth of who he made you to be? The fourth level of change is our beliefs. People began to believe they could break the four minute mile and so look what happened, they did. Let me ask you, do you think there is a difference between our thoughts and our beliefs? Yes, we have lots of thoughts going through our mind all the time. You might be sitting there thinking, man, I wonder how long she's going to talk or I hope the person next to me doesn't hear my stomach rumble or I wonder what we're gonna eat when we finished. We just have thousands of thoughts that zoom in and out of our minds or at least in and out of my mind all day long. Um, and, and this is how we make decisions. We have these thoughts. Thoughts are in our mind. We usually can put words to them and, and describe them and we change them quite easily. In fact, all the husbands in here will know that it is a woman's prerogative to change her mind, isn't it? Yes, but beliefs are different. Beliefs sound like this. I can never do anything right. No one likes me. I'm ugly. A thought becomes a belief when there is a judgment attached to it. When that happens, our thoughts move from our head to our heart. And now it is a belief and it is much stronger. Just listen to this statement. I think I'm good enough or I believe that I am good enough. Beliefs are much stronger. Often, we can't even put words to them and we may not even be aware of some of the beliefs we have because we have been collecting them from the day that we were born. A belief is not just in our heart, it's over our heart, like a contact lens. Like Wendy's dirty window, it skews our perception <clears throat> of what is true and what is real about us. And our beliefs have a profound effect on our behavior. Scripture tells us this, Proverbs 23, seven says, as a man thinks in his heart, so he is. The scripture says, not as a man thinks in his head, as a man thinks in his heart. So it is our beliefs in our heart that determine who we are. And Proverbs 4 and verse 24 says, above all else, guard your heart because everything you do flows from it. Our false beliefs about ourselves become our source of truth. But when we hear scriptural truth, when we see what God has to say about us, when we start hearing his voice, the God who spoke the whole world into existence has the power to change our beliefs to change how we see ourselves. And that is true and lasting change. 
So my dad was a very angry man with a violent temper. And uh, when I was little, I'm talking, you know, three, four, five, uh, I often caught the other end of that stick. So I learned to uh, keep my distance. I never knew how he was going to react. And I tried my best to do everything he needed me to do, because if I didn't, I would feel it. Finally, my parents got divorced when I was about seven. My dad threatened to hurt us, and so my mom sent us to go live with my grandparents far away, um, where he wouldn't find us. And uh, they were in their 70s, so they couldn't really take care of us. We were sent to boarding school, and during the weeks we were at boarding school, and on weekends we were with my grandparents. Now, I think most of you probably don't have a frame of reference for boarding school, so just imagine Harry Potter and Hogwarts without the magic wand. It's not a very friendly, warm place. But my grandparents did the best they could, and they loved us, and they also loved the Lord. And so that was the year that I learned about Jesus, and I accepted him. When the dust finally settled and my mom was on her feet, we went back to live with my mother, who now was a single mom, uh, working very hard to put food on the table. And so I basically had to grow up. I was taking care of my brother and his homework. I was doing cooking, I was cleaning, uh, taking care of my own stuff. I was nine years old. I didn't really think anything about it. It just was the way things were for me. My dad was also supposed to come and get us on weekends. And regularly, we would pack our little bag and wait, and he would forget. He would forget to come and get us. Or he would pick us up and he would take us to his mom, drop us off for the weekend and come and pick up us on a Sunday. These times were some of the hardest times of my life. I clearly remember my heart breaking over and over and over until one day, I didn't need my dad anymore. I didn't need him or anybody else. I made up my mind that if I was going to get something done, I was gonna have to do it myself because there was nobody around. I became very independent and I didn't trust many people, least of all men. And I decided that I was never going to let somebody break my heart again. So, based on our life experiences, we begin to develop beliefs about God, we develop beliefs about ourselves, and we develop beliefs about other people. What do you believe about God? I accepted Jesus when I was little, I told you, uh, through my grandmother. I knew somehow that Jesus would be there for me. But when I started learning about God, the Father, who was loving, who wanted to take me in his arms and provide for me and take care of me, I had zero frame of reference for that. I believed in God, but I was afraid of him. I knew that if I didn't follow the rules, I would go to hell, and I was afraid of going to hell, so I followed the rules. I walked around thinking that if I step out of line, he would zap me. Even though I went to church and I prayed, I did not have a relationship with God. So my experience had, had a profound found effect on how I viewed God. And I bet that there are many of you sitting there who have some false beliefs about who God really is based on the things that have happened to you until today. Our experiences also help us form beliefs about ourselves. 
when our girls were little, we have four little girls, we used to go to uh, the beach every summer on a summer vacation. And uh, one day we came back from the beach and they're all in the shower and eventually I walked into the bedroom only to find one of them who shall remain anonymous because she'd kill me if I told you who she was, standing in front of the mirror, gazing at herself. She had long blonde hair and she tossed her head back and she said, oh, I could so be a mermaid. So <laughs> she was mortified when she saw me. And of course, we do not let an opportunity go by without teasing her. So this morning, when you woke up and walked into the bathroom and looked in the mirror, did you look at yourself and think, oh, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Yep, oh, I could so be a mermaid. <laughs> I'm not talking to you guys. I hope you have never thought that. I don't think that. My childhood also influenced what I thought about myself. I never had friends, and there were a few reasons for that. Firstly, in those days, people weren't divorced, and I was terribly ashamed of that. The second thing was that we moved a lot, and so I was always the new kid. I never had any friends. Um, and then lastly, as a nine-year-old little girl, my life was so different to other little girls who were playing with dolls and doing ballet that I had nothing to say to them. So instead of drawing the conclusion, looking at the facts and seeing them for what they were, the conclusion I came to was that nobody wants to be around me. I'm never going to be picked for the team. Nobody does wants me at the sleepover. And I became more and more isolated from people through my own choice because I had decided nobody was going to hurt me again. So let me ask you, what things have influenced your beliefs about yourself? We are more likely to believe the positive things. Let me say that again. Are we more likely to believe the positive things God says about us or the negative conclusions that we come to? Do you think about your strengths or do you focus on your weaknesses? I would venture to guess that like me, you are very quick to believe the lies about yourself. And then we also form beliefs about other people based on our experience. If I asked you quickly, name three people that really annoy you. Could you do that? Don't answer. But here's what God says. He loves them like he loves us, and we're supposed to love them too. To feel valued is something that is so powerful that we will sacrifice almost anything for something that will make us feel valued. We will sacrifice our family for a big check or a fancy title or our ministry. And sometimes we cling to things that make us feel valuable. Things like how my children perform, or how my house is decorated, or the car I drive, or even things like how much I volunteer. We all have things that make us feel valued, but in reality, there's only one thing that can make us feel truly valued. And it is not people or things. True value comes from who we are in Christ. That is our identity. And we will be talking all of next week 
about our identity and how the enemy steals it. So whether it is our environment, whether it is our behavior, or our capabilities, or our beliefs, as long as we are arm wrestling ourselves at these four levels, we end up feeling failures and we end up being frustrated. And we do damage to our souls because we have false hope on a good day and no hope on a bad day. Everybody depressed? (laughs) There is good news. There is a way to change. And it has been proven over and over that the way to affect true, real, permanent change in us doesn't come from the bottom up, it comes from the top down. It is when we understand what our true identity is, who we were made and redeemed to be. As believers, our identity comes from God. So that's why the first thing we talked about in Freedom Basics last week was hearing from God. Everything hinges on whether or not we're going to hear from God. Pastor Dan told us that God is a God of words. He's a God of communication. He spoke the whole world into existence and Jesus is the word. And if we cannot hear him and we don't feel as if we can speak to him, it seriously affects our relationship with him and our relationship with the people around us. Most of us have far more confidence in hearing the devil talk to us than in hearing the voice of God. If I asked you, how many of you regularly hear the voice of condemnation and judgment? Things like, I am a loser, nobody cares. I'm on my own, I might as well quit. I bet you most of you would raise your hands. But if I asked you, how many of us hear God speak to us daily? Things like, I am a child of the most high king. I am a friend of Jesus. I am chosen, holy, blameless before God. I think few of us would raise our hands to say we hear that daily. Do you see how backwards that is? God has something to say to each one of us every day. He longs for us to hear him and he longs to hear us. True lasting change only comes from understanding who God says we are, and from cultivating that relationship with him of hearing and of speaking. True freedom is not about being set free from something. It is about who we are being set free to become. I want to repeat that. True freedom is not about being set free from something. It is about who we are being set free to become. We read in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. And in Colossians 1.13, we see that he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of our sin. These are amazing scriptures. When we are saved, we are a new creation living in a new kingdom. But why do I feel stuck? in my little loop. Why can I not break out of that? I think it's because many of us have never heard the whole 
gospel. You may have heard that you need to accept Jesus Christ. Because if you don't, you will go to hell. And you don't wanna go to hell. So you accept Jesus Christ and you got a ticket to heaven. That is great news. That is truth. And I'm glad you all have a ticket to heaven. But salvation is about a lot more than just heaven or hell. Salvation is about a lot more than whether I'm in or whether I am out. Jesus came to give us a package. And I wish we could all speak Greek because if we did, we could read the New Testament the way it was written. And then you would know that the word saved means lots more than how we understand it. Let me read to you, uh, where is it? Uh, to save means to rescue to deliver, to heal, to restore, and to make whole. I don't know about you, but I want all of that kind of save. But I was never told that when I got saved, when I accepted Christ. I don't think we know the whole gospel. Listen to what Jesus said in the first sermon he chose to preach in his hometown, Luke 4, verse 18. He says, The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind and set the oppressed free and to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. He wants to do a lot more than save us. First, he says he wants to heal the brokenhearted. Raise your hand if you've ever had a broken heart. Keep it up if you've had more than one. Jesus came to heal every broken heart experience you've ever had. Jesus came to take away every hurt memory that is in you. But do you take the time to go to him and give this to him and allow him to do the hard work for you? No, we try and do the hard work ourselves. The verse says that he came to make the blind see, which means physical healing. He came so that we can ask and receive physical healing. He came to set the oppressed free. In our Christian life, there are all kinds of things that can oppress us. Jesus himself spoke about demons. So we need to talk about demons too. There's so much misunderstanding about demons and how they can influence us as believers. A Christian cannot be possessed by a demon, but we can be oppressed and attacked by them. Imagine if you came here tonight and you left your front door wide open. And when you get back, there's a guy in your house stealing your stuff. Now, Is it your house? Yes. Did he have a right to be in your house? No. Is he stealing your stuff? Yes. In the same way, we can leave our spiritual house open. We can leave doors open that make it easier for demons and the enemy to attack us and to oppress us. And in this walk, we are going to take time to look at the things in our life that we may have done that has left a door open and we're going to close those doors so that the enemy can no longer oppress us because Jesus said he came to set the oppressed free. Kairos Freedom Ministry will deal with every one of these topics in time and in depth. So the good news is that Jesus came to save us, the whole save, the expanded definition we talked about early. But our part is to surrender to him, to stop hiding and pretending like everything is fine, to simply say, I am a mess. By learning to hear God's voice, 
and taking time to engage with him. By hearing who he says I am. By understanding how the enemy has deceived me and hurt me because of the things that I have believed about myself. Little by little, God has healed my heart. And I can stand here tonight and I can tell you that I have come a long way. The Lord has taught me many things and I am much cleaner than what I used to be. But he is by far not done with me and I am still a mess. There is great comfort in knowing that it is God who is at work in me, both to will and to work for his good purpose. We are all on a journey and it is a process, but we are on a road to freedom. It will take time. God transforms us from the top down as lie by lie is peeled away and we begin to understand who he made us to be, he begins to heal our hearts. Our part is to stay engaged and to stay the course because it doesn't happen overnight. The Lord began working in my heart with the birth of my first child and she's about to be 29. I don't wanna discourage you. Uh, I did not have Kairos. I had to wing it. Um, but it takes time, it is a journey that we're on and God is never done with us. It's worth it though, if we hang in there, it is worth it. I asked you at the beginning, have you ever wondered how Paul got to that place to say no matter what my circumstances, I am content? Well, he reached this place where he surrendered to God. He surrendered to everything that the Lord was doing in his life. He understood who God had made him to be. And he knew that he was a child of the Most High King. So I have learned that freedom is not the absence of anything. It is more of the presence of God in our lives. I would like for us to spend some time in prayer. I'm going to lead you through prayer. If you would bow your heads and, and just follow along with me. Lord, I do not want to assume anything tonight. Maybe there's somebody here who accepted you a long time ago, who has their ticket to heaven. But maybe they did not know what your salvation was all about. Maybe they did not know, Jesus, that when you came to save us, you came to restore us and heal us and rescue us and make us whole. Please take some time and tell Jesus. Jesus, I really want to experience everything you did the day you saved me. I want to surrender every area of my life to you. Invite him in to completely rescue you, to deliver you, 
to heal you and to restore you, to make you whole. Maybe you have been trying hard to keep the rules for a long time and you're tired. I invite you to resign from that tonight. Tell God you don't want that anymore. That you want to surrender all your stuff to him. Why don't you tell God that you don't want to hide anymore? that you are willing to admit that you've been hurt, that you've messed up, that you have come to believe things about yourselves that are not the truth. And ask him to begin to show you who he thinks you are. And now if you will take a moment quietly in your heart as an act of your will to surrender yourself to this journey that we are calling freedom. To resign from your position in control and say, Jesus, I want to let you transfer me. I want to let you change me. We thank you, Jesus that you came to teach us the gospel. You came to set the captives free. You came to heal the blind, to free the oppressed. And we ask you in the name of Jesus to be with us as you do these things in our life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If any of you feel that you would want to spend some time with one of our prayer partners, if the prayer partners will make themselves available around here, please feel free, there's no hurry. Um, Go pray with somebody if you need. We will be back here next week, same place, same time, and we will be talking about identity theft. Thank you very much for coming.